Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. In 1939, the world stood on the brink of war. Germany, Italy, Russia, and Japan were already transformed into armed camps. England, France, and the United States were about to learn a new vocabulary. Blitzkrieg, Stuka, Kamikaze. And in America, our army was woefully unprepared. Strangled by lack of funds, it was small, ill-equipped and antiquated. Do you remember when a private's pay was $21 a month? Yes, these were our soldiers in 1939. America's poor relations, sometimes without even enough uniforms to go around. For during the 30s, the army was like the clergyman who had to earn his pay and beg it too. There was no money available to replace World War I type clothing and equipment. The old overseas cap, the bold action Springfield rifle. Many Americans just didn't care. I don't want my son in the army. European wars don't mean nothing to me. Our tanks were slow, clumsy, inadequately armed and inadequately armored. While newer tanks had already been tested and approved, there were no funds with which to put them into production. Hitler's mechanized forces were sweeping across Europe, and we were training horses. While by early 1940, America was starting to come out of the doldrums, we were still almost completely unprepared should war come. There were more field exercises like the Carolina maneuvers, but the army still did not have the full support of Congress or the American people. Lacking almost every essential of a modern fighting force, our military men just had to do the best they could with whatever tools were at hand. Old equipment was kept in repair and made to run. Pieces of pipe served as field artillery. Bags of flour as shell bursts and pieces of wood as machine guns. Although France fell while the Selective Service Act was debated for 86 days in Congress, America was starting to wake up. But the real awakening did not come until Pearl Harbor. Despite these disastrous beginnings, thanks to hard work, brave men and women, and God's help, we won the war. America is determined never to be caught short again. In today's big picture, we are going to show you first some of the very latest developments in military equipment. Equipment which is part of your Army's plan to remain strong and ready. You are going to see planes that fly without pilots, machines that can see in the dark, and many of the other miracles which are being performed at the Army Electronic Proving Grounds in Huachuca, Arizona. In the heart of the great Southwest lies Fort Huachuca, one of the most modern of all the Army's installations. Here in this desolate country, surrounded by empty desert and mountains, 
the Army has found an ideal proving grounds for newly developed electronic equipment. Today, more than 8,000 military and civilian personnel are working together, testing and improving modern miracles of military science. Because the Army must be prepared to defend against push-button warfare, every effort is being made to keep abreast of the very latest scientific advances. We have come a long way from the wigwag flags used by the Army in Indian warfare to this tiny transistor. Powerful miniature devices like this have paved the way for new, compact, lightweight electronic equipment. There she goes, the new pilotless plane, the drone. Here's a closer look at this amazing reconnaissance robot recently tested at Fort Huachuca. Called the drone, it is designed to carry photographic equipment or a TV camera. Only 15 feet long, the radio-controlled drone reaches a speed of 220 miles an hour within seconds of takeoff. While a drone takes all the risks, its pilot remains safely behind in a mobile control van. Not only does the drone save lives, but it is inexpensive, easy to transport and set up, and capable of flying in any weather. Military observer teams watch as an RP-71 drone conducts a simulated photo reconnaissance mission and this is what the drone sees. A clear picture like this would quickly reveal any enemy vehicles or troops. From the top of the control van, an optical tracking device follows the flight of the drone. At the same time, radar is also used, thus enabling the drone's operator to know and chart its location at all times. Its mission completed, the pilotless plane turns for home. When the drone has returned to its launching site, its engine is cut off and a parachute inside released. The photos taken by this drone were developed less than an hour after the original launching a dramatic demonstration of military science in action at Fort Huachuca. Some photo missions require a human observer. Light aviation is the Army's answer to this problem, and every day a special test mission is flown. These daily flights begin when the aerial photo interpretation officer first receives a request for reconnaissance. For these tests, a special camera is used. Effective anywhere from 500 to 10,000 feet, it records what it sees on a 9 inch by 9 inch negative. Meanwhile, the pilot and his photographer are briefed on their objective. They are shown what areas must be covered and given the correct altitude at which to fly. Should this be a night flight, the L-19 light plane would be equipped with infrared photographic material. Since the Army must be ready for a fluid type of combat, light aviation is playing an ever-increasing role in the military's plans. On simulated missions of this sort, great emphasis is placed on speed. It is vital that there be no delay, that these flights be accomplished quickly and accurately. These young pilots are very skillful, for the name Huachuca means windy mountain, and the up and down drafts found in the area make this tricky flying indeed. Its mission completed, the L-19 returns to the Fort Huachuca landing strip. Only 18 minutes have passed from the first request for aerial reconnaissance to the return of the photo team. 
To save a few precious seconds, the plane makes a power landing and taxis swiftly to its tie-down space. A waiting crewman quickly removes the 30-pound camera from its mounting. When the Army is satisfied that this system of frontline photography is perfected, major combat units will be equipped with teams like this. The film is rushed to a mobile laboratory, which is only a few yards from the airfield. In this portable darkroom, the prints are quickly developed. The finished photographs, still wet from the developer, are then hurried to the tent of the aerial photo interpreter, where they will be closely studied and analyzed. In this particular mission, only 32 minutes elapsed from the original phone call asking for aerial reconnaissance to the delivery of the finished prints. These daily flights enable the Army to study its system under all conditions and also to train the men of the photo teams. In the signal communications department, other experiments are being made. Remember the old walkie-talkie of World War II? Well, this is the way it has shrunk in less than 12 years. Smaller, lighter, and easier to operate, this miniature radio has the same capabilities as its larger and bulkier ancestor. Barely larger than a pack of cigarettes, it is being adapted to a variety of uses in the field. One small radio has already been built into an infantryman's helmet. More and more of these tiny radios are being used by the infantry. Lives will be saved through better communications when this radio helmet is perfected. Under battle conditions, it will be possible for a forward observer to communicate directly with a squad leader in the rear to inform him of the combat situation ahead. Other members of the squad can listen with their helmet radios and also be completely informed. When the observer reports that an advance is safe, the squad leader orders his men forward. The radio helmet, one more way of safeguarding American lives, part of an ever-improving army. Bad weather is a major problem to the military. The Fort Huachuca Aviation Department is now experimenting with a new method of all-weather flight control. Here, a miracle is truly being wrought. The ATCAN, a system of seeing in the dark. For with this new radar guidance device, aircraft will be able to fly under almost any weather conditions. ATCAN consists of rows of radar beacons placed below designated air channels. A pilot, receiving radar signals from the beacons, can find his way safely above them even in poor visibility. For many months, Fort Huachuca pilots have been conducting test flights with ATCAN under the supervision of aviation specialists. Each day, a flight is made from the local airfield to a forward landing strip on the other side of the mountains. Although these trips have become routine, they are not without an element of danger. To complete the illusion of a combat mission, the planes are loaded with supplies for the forward field. It is a 40-mile flight over jagged mountains to the dirt runway at the Kinsey Landing Strip. This specially equipped L-20 Beaver is a rugged, heavy-duty plane which carries far more technical apparatus than its civilian counterparts. Nearby is a portable air traffic control van, which exercises the same control over military aircraft as does a civilian airport tower over commercial planes. Mountains coming up.
That can, which has a number of uses, is employed in good weather as well as bad, but it is primarily a foul weather aid. One sign of poor conditions ahead is when a plane starts to bounce while still in the clear. Should the weather change, and in this part of the country, sudden and drastic changes are often found, the control van, which acts as a sort of aerial traffic cop, will alert the pilots to what they may expect ahead and help them plot their best course. It is when a plane lurches into heavy going and the visibility diminishes to close to zero that the pilots rely most on the radar beacons below them. Meanwhile, the air traffic van keeps in touch with the plane until it has cleared the mountains and left the bad weather behind. The L-20 Beaver then lands safely at the Kinsey Field airstrip. The ATCAN guidance system is still being tested thanks to the devotion and courage of the men who fly these daily missions, the U.S. Army pilots. One more aspect of Fort Huachuca, where 8,000 men and women are working to find new ways of protecting America. Yes, today's Army scientists are keeping the American fighting man equipped with the very latest developments of our defense program. Now we'd like to show you a different aspect of America's defense preparations. We take you to the little town of Galax, Virginia. Just over a hundred years ago, a small group of Quakers founded a little farming community in southern Virginia and named it Galax. That little community has grown into a bustling, prosperous township of 7,000 inhabitants. Recently, Galax decided to hold a centennial jubilee to celebrate 100 years of freedom and achievement in America. During the preparations for this celebration, two representatives of the Virginia Military District arrived in Galax. They went directly to the offices of the Chamber of Commerce. Captain Miles Pondelesic and Master Sergeant Lacey Burns explained the purpose of their visit to explore the possibility of forming an Army Reserve training company in Galax. Miles Morgan, manager of the Chamber of Commerce, was interested in their suggestion. At the weekly luncheon meeting of the Chamber of Commerce, he brought the matter up. Not only did the other members approve the suggestion, but they volunteered to help and formed a committee to assist in the project. A countywide publicity campaign was organized. Free radio time was made available. The Galax Gazette ran a front page story and provided free advertisements. Posters were printed and widely displayed. Captain Pondelesic spoke to local civic organizations. And as the drive for the reserve company gathered momentum, a recruiting booth was set up on the town's main street. Wherever they could be of assistance, the captain and the sergeant were to be found. They visited private homes, explaining to the town's young men and to their families the provisions of the Reserve Act of 1955. They answered questions outlining the obligations and benefits of reserve membership. Sometimes the most searching questions came from the boys themselves. And many came to join. There was Bill Ross, farmer. Bob Williams, mechanic. Mac Bedsall, salesman. Walt Jennings, who served as a captain during World War II. John Faddis, laundryman. Youngsters and veterans alike joined up. 
In less than two weeks, more than five times as many men volunteered as were needed. At an informal meeting, the new reservists were told more about their unit, the 978th Quartermaster Company, of its combat record in Normandy and through Western Europe in World War II. These are American men, proud to answer their country's call. During the next few days, the men were processed. Questionnaires had to be answered. Army physicals taken. And the men fingerprinted, of course. From the nearby quartermaster depot came uniforms and equipment. A full allotment for each man was issued. The Chamber of Commerce offices were overflowing. On the day of the company's activation, high-ranking military officials flew into Galax. Senior officer among them was Brigadier General Philip F. Lindemann. For the first time, the men of the 978th were assembled in full uniform. The swearing-in ceremony began the activation proceedings. This ceremony took place only three weeks from the day that Captain Pondalesic and Sergeant Burns arrived in Galax. The rapid formation of this unit was made possible only by the wholehearted support of all the citizens of Galax. General Lindemann congratulated the men and the town on behalf of President Eisenhower and the Department of the Army. He paid tribute to Galax as a model community, ready and willing to stand behind its country and its government. Then the company's colors were presented to Captain Jennings, the new company commander. The following day, the men were called together for their first official military function, to march in the Centennial Parade. Captain Jennings assumed command and inspected his new company. This is a small unit, made up of the men from only one community. But today, all over the United States, more than 2,000 American cities and towns can boast of their own Army Reserve training companies. These men were proud to march in their town's centennial celebration. The parade began with an honor guard. You've all seen military parades before, but how many of you have ever seen one like this? For this centennial jubilee, clothing appeared from attics and trunks. Some of these garments were actually worn by the original founders of Galax. Everybody loves a parade, but most of all, the kids. For Galax, this was Mardi Gras, Circus Day, and the 4th of July all rolled into one. And here
here comes the military. Behind a second honor guard march the men of the Galax Reserve. Captain Pondalesic and Sergeant Burns paid their respects, together with thousands of others. It is the determination of men like these that will keep American democracy safe. For they know that freedom is everybody's business. The men at Galax and the scientists at Fort Huachuca are all part of one great team. Your army, dedicated to preserving peace through strength, working to keep America truly the arsenal of democracy. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.